You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Michael Ferris Smith on the show with me. He, uh, as you all know, uh, I am uh, based out of Mississippi and, uh, and love living in the South. And it's always fun when I get to connect with other authors that share you know, a bit of the same heritage that I do and the, the love and appreciation for the Southern tradition of writing. And uh, Michael is no exception there. Michael, his latest book uh, is, uh, is called Nick. And Nick is, what a phenomenal book. This took me completely by surprise, Michael. Um, Nick is the story of the Great Gatsby before the Great Gatsby and uh, takes a look at, at that time period and uh, and the events surrounding Gatsby in a new and fresh way. What an exciting book. I love it. I'm telling everybody about it. Um, welcome to the show, Michael. Hi, Nate. Yeah, thanks for all that. And thank you for having me. It's uh, good to talk. Always nice to interview with another Mississippi voice. So, yeah, thanks again. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Michael, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, wow. Why don't you start off with something like, what's your birthday, your favorite ice cream? Uh, something like that. Um, you know, I didn't come to writing until probably much later in life, and a lot of people kind of come to it. I, I would say my first memories of really wanting to do it, and I think to the point to where I felt some type of um, earnest um, motivation toward it, um, I was probably... 27, 28 years old, and I was living abroad at the time. Um, and I had spent a good good few years then uh, just spending a lot of time reading um, as I was sitting in the cafes and on the park benches and riding on the trains back and forth across Western Europe. And uh, something just seemed to move in me um, during that time. I think it had a lot to do with uh, some things that had probably been dormant in me for a long time, kind of coming back to life. Uh, but those are my first memories when I started thinking, you know what, if I, if I do go back home, if I do go back to Mississippi, I think I'm going to see um, if I'm able to put some words down on paper myself. So, you know, it hasn't been that terribly long ago, I suppose. We, um, you know, as Mississippians, we have a um, uh, kind of a, a storied past in, in a lot of ways. Um, and mixed in that storied past is this strong literary tradition that that a lot of people overlook. And then uh, when you point it out to them, you know, some of their favorite authors are, are from Mississippi. And, and that's um, and there's there's something about Mississippi writers that that connect with the you know, this this odd mixture of, of heat and humidity and, um, you know, the human trials and struggle and, and you know, a, a unique gumbo comes out of that. Um, did did you feel any connection to to the the Mississippiness of the art form uh, or, or is this something that, that maybe you you felt later on that um, is there something uniquely um, other about uh mississippi writers um well yes to all of that yes there is something uniquely other about mississippi writers like you know over the past years of having some success and being out and going to different places i always get asked about being a mississippi writer and what it feels like and what it means and why do so many writers come out of there and I, you know i would even say being a mississippi writer is different than being a southern writer I think there's something uh, uniquely inherent uh, to being a Mississippi writer that I think even separates you from just being kind of uh, categorized as a Southern writer. Yes, I have those things on my mind. If it, if it wouldn't have been for my Mississippi roots and my awareness of the Mississippi literary tradition, I wonder if I would have had the same 
um, not just draw to it, but the same kind of belief that it can happen. Now, you know, an an another thing I get asked a lot is, you know, with the Mississippi tradition, with the Welties and the Faulkners and uh, the Willie Morrises and Richard Wright and Tennessee Williams, and then later Larry Brown, Barry Hanna, Ellen Gilchrist, and so forth and so on, uh, you know, was it intimidating? Is it intimidating to have Faulkner looking over your shoulder and, you know, questions like that? And I was like, I never saw it as intimidation, I saw it as possibility. I mean, the thing that it gave me was this notion that it can be done because it has been done over and over and over. There's been Mississippi writer after Mississippi writer who has made their mark. And so it's possible. And none of them came from anything ex extravagant roots. None of them came from any type of incredible, incredible background, whether educationally or, you know, whatever. They were people just like you. And if you want to do it, there, those are your examples of what can be done. So that's that's really what I felt about it. And I think that helped motivate me versus kind of scare me away. I've, I've asked other Southern writers uh, a question like this and, and then Mississippi, Mississippi writers as well. Um, Greg Isles has been on the show, some others, uh, Ace Adkins, uh, different folks who are following in the, the, the Mississippi writer tradition. Um, what is it? Do you think that um, that makes better storytellers, uh, you know, people from the South uh, in general, Mississippi, maybe specifically, um, you know, thinking back on my family, you know, there there are many colorful characters uh, in, in my family tree that, uh, you know, great uncles and stuff that you would sit on the porch and just listen to them tell stories and they're funny. And, uh, you know, maybe not all that you would want to have in polite company, um, you know, but just you know, there's something there's something about uh, Southern writers that I, I don't know if it's the, the fact that, you know, there was a lot of porch sitting and getting out of the heat of the house in the, the long summer afternoons. And, you know, you would find ways to pass the time. Uh, but what do you think it is? That, that creates this great atmosphere for storytelling? That's such a loaded question. It's more like a panel discussion at a book festival, which could go on for hours. Um, but you know, because I, I think about it too, because I get asked about it a lot. And I'm sure my my answer changes, you know, every time it's, it's sure. different. Um, I, think, um, I think Mississippi in general is just such a world of contradiction. I mean, it can be very kind and loving and warm one minute. It can be very cruel and divisive and prejudice the next. Um, oftentimes, those are the exact same people behaving in, the, in both of those yeah. ways just within a matter of, of hours or a matter of days, depending on what the subject matter is and depending on who they're dealing with. Um, there's uh, enough churches, you know, to basically fill up a continent all crammed into Mississippi. There's also a lot of liquor stores and there's also a lot of good music and a lot of good dance. And there's uh, very generational um, aspects of Mississippi, a tremendous amount of history, whether good or bad. Um, there's so much deeply rooted, I think, from from one generation to the next so that stories are kind of fed over and over and over. And then I, I do think, at least from my South Mississippi upbringing, there's, um, I think there's kind of a Louisiana influence that seeps, in, seeps into uh, Mississippi also, which, uh, you know, Louisiana is certainly kind of its own world itself. But when you kind of have those two kind of things uh, kind of bleeding together in Mississippi, you, you've got religion, you've got superstition i mean it's just a whirlwind of contradictions and uh, i think if you are raised in the south or in mississippi and you grow up around these things and particularly as you get older and you start to think for yourself and you start to make realizations on your own you realize just um how complex and unexplainable this place is um so when you sit down to write stories i think things come out of you probably naturally that aren't going to come out um from people in other places because they haven't had, you know, such experience is, um, excuse me, such experiences of, of, uh, of all those things I mentioned. And two, 
it just becomes a natural part of your conversation. It's nothing you have to force. And I think that's another very important aspect of writing fiction is it has to be organic. It has to be natural to give it the type of life and passion and emotion that it has to have. So I think uh, that's my very cliff notes answer to that very big question. But that's kind of the way I tend to think about it. Looking for a tool to help you visualize your story before the drafting begins? PlotPens is cloud-based and optimized for any device. There's nothing to download. From the new writer who isn't sure how to tell their story to the veteran who can increase their productivity dramatically, we've had experienced writers lay out a detailed structure for several novels in a series in a matter of a few days. The app takes you through four steps of the process. The concept or logline. Make sure you have a solid concept that you can keep coming back to throughout the process. The outline, 12 beats and three acts, each has a description of what should be happening with examples. The board, 40 cards. We take the 12 beats and add sub beats to those, breaking it down even further and being very specific about what should go into each. These also have examples and descriptions. Right. We take those 40 cards and turn them into a to-do list. For a 50,000 word book, it's about two cards per chapter roughly. We have a beautiful editor built into the app. You can export your manuscript to a PDF anytime with the click of a button. Let Plot Pins help you visualize your writing project. Use code HANK10 to get 10% off Plot Pins. PlotPins.com. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. A whirlwind of contradictions may be the the best summary um, that I think I've ever heard. I, I love that, and and I'm going to borrow that from you if you don't mind. Be sure you credit credit. <laughs> I, I will. I promise. I promise. Um, I'll make sure the checks get sent to the right place. Um, <laughs> Michael, you have written stories about Mississippi. You have written stories that are not based in Mississippi. Um, the what is it that uh, uh, that that inspires you to write a story that's that's placed in a place that 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 you know so well? And and what inspires you to write something like Nick? Um, you know that that's based on on a story that we're all familiar with, but is absolutely not a mississippi story it, it does is there something that that tells you in the beginning creative phase where where a story is birthed um whether this is going to be you know something that's that's based in a particular place uh or do the characters define that for you what what anchors a story where it is hmm also a good question um i never think about place when I'm when I have the initial uh, 
instinct for a story. And I will say that it doesn't matter where my novels are set, every one of them begins the same way in that I get this notion in my head of a, of a character in a, some type of situation, but whether it's just an image in my head or, or just a thought um, that's kind of stuck in there. Um, but it's something that I can't shake and that keeps me up at night. And I keep thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And I, that's how I know that's what I'm supposed to sit down and try to uh, start following along and try to write about. Um, it's been the exact same for every novel, you know, even Nick, such an extraordinary experience that was. And, but it, the, still the genesis and the seed of it all was just me being really struck by this notion, this idea that I wanted to, um, to dive into and that I wanted to, uh, that I was extraordinarily curious about. And it, I don't know that that impulse was any different than when I had the image of a woman and a child walking down the interstate, um, carrying a, a garbage bag with everything they own thrown over their shoulder, which is the image that began Desperation Road, um, and so forth and so on. I could give you each, each thing for each novel that stuck in my head and wouldn't let me, wouldn't let me forget about it, that made me sit down and, and realize this is what you're supposed to be following. It's, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's not as a kind of impulsive as the light bulb moment that you see in cartoons when the light bulb <laughs> shows up over someone's head, but it's something that, that kind of gets into me that I think about and I just kind of keep thinking about it, keep, keep thinking about it. And when I can't shake it, I know that that's the thing. Um, Cause a lot of things come and go through your mind. You're always kind of eye open for a story for this or that and the other. And you know, if they come and they go, you know, I, I've learned not to force it. When something kind of sits in my mind very organically, that's when I know uh, that that's the thing to chase after. And then, you know, it, it, and then it depends, you know, the woman, the woman and the child walking down the side of the road in Desperation Road, like the moment I had that image in my head, I knew exactly where they were. I knew they were walking up I-55, crossing from Louisiana over into Mississippi. I just kind of knew where they were. And when I had the notion of Jack Boucher in the fighter driving through the middle of the night in his truck and describing the pain he goes through and uh, all those things he was feeling, I just kind of impulsively knew he was driving into the Delta. Um, it just kind of kind of comes together, I guess, in some some way I can't really explain, but I, I kind of instinctively know, um, you know, where they are when this is going on. Michael, we have uh, certain terms for writers in the writer community where we like to put people in one camp or another, but I'm going to ask this question to you a little differently. Um, when when you start kind of wrestling with that first idea, the idea that won't leave you alone, are you the kind of writer that when when that's kind of settled in your mind, you sit down and you plan out the novel before you start writing? Or are you the kind of writer that gets to know the characters and uncovers their situation through writing it? Yeah, that second thing. I don't ever plan very far ahead. I mean, I discover the characters on the page, you know, I don't make notes off to the side. I don't open documents and write character descriptions or this or that and the other. I open up what I think is going to be the novel and I start working on it and I start trying to discover those characters on the page. Um, Cause to me, that's the most impulsive they're going to get. And I want them to be impulsive. And I, you know, it's not that you don't go back and tinker with them, and make them this way or that way or change this or change that, that about them down the road. But I, I like to discover it as I go along. I don't plan very far ahead. Whenever I stop working for a day, I make myself a couple of notes for what I think is coming tomorrow. So I'll kind of have a jumping off point. And that's really about as far as I go. Um, I really like the discovery process of it. And I feel like if I'm discovering day to day and I'm not looking too far ahead, then the reader is going to feel that same notion of discovery as they're turning from page to page. I get asked all the time, well, when did you know this was going to happen? Or, or when did you know this was going to happen? And I usually, my answer is usually the moment that you realized it was happening. Um, it's when I kind of realized it was happening. It popped out of me and popped onto the page and, and there we were. Like I say, you know, there's exceptions to all that. Um, certainly at any, some, as the novel gets bigger and bigger, you just have to start piecing things together and make sure everything makes sense. And you might have some big notion of, 
um, where things are going. Um, but in general, it's a feel your way as you go, which I, I really like it that way. You know, the, the biggest argument um, against writing that way is, you know, people that are in the planner camp will say, yeah, but what happens when you write yourself into a corner and you don't know where the story's going to go? Um, as, as someone who discovery writes like you do, do you ever find yourself in that situation? Uh, or you, have you just learned to just trust yourself and your intuition that the, the story's going to show up when you need it to? Well, I think both of those things. I think a, le- a very important lesson I learned as a writer and as a novelist was probably in the writing of, well, you know, it had to be in the hands of strangers, but I do think in Rivers, because Rivers was kind of a bigger, much bigger thing. Um, When I first started trying to write novels, I kind of would write myself into a tough spot. And I would get a little intimidated by it, and I would start, I would try to write myself out of it by thinking, oh God, I don't know what to do now. I need to back up and I need to make this where I can get out of it. And I'll, I swear to God, the thought just hit me one day. Why are you trying to back out of that? Like, that's what you're, you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be trying to get these people into impossible situations. <laughs> and if you don't know what's going to happen to them, the reader certainly doesn't know what's going to happen. And so that's exactly what you need to be doing. Quit being a wuss, essentially. I, probably use some more colorful language to my, with myself, but, you know, quit being a wuss. I mean, this is what you want. You should be embracing this. And when I had that thought, my novel writing life changed and I am unafraid to write myself into a corner because I have complete confidence that instinct will take over and story will take over. And then if I just keep driving them through it, I will figure, find the way out of it. And then the goal is to get them into another difficult spot that you don't know how they're going to get out of. It's not just a one trick pony in the course of a novel. I feel like there's have, have to be a lot of rises and falls, but it's kind of, you know, both of those things. I, I was kind of scared by it at first, but when I realized those are the moments you should be living for as a writer, embrace it and tackle it head on, then um, it really did change the dynamic of how I go about writing a novel and, and the fact that I know somehow, some way it's going to work out. I, I think that's such a great thing, Michael, that, um, you know, if it, if you can't put these characters into an impossible situation and then figure out how to get them out of there, then, then you might as well go be a carpenter or something, uh, you know, that's go right. do something else. You know, that the, the whole point of writing is to, is, is to do your job and, and get them into bad situations and then figure out how to get them out. Absolutely. And I think you have to be fearless. Um, and you know, once I embrace that, it, it really is just kind of not even change the notion of how like the process goes, but just the way I think about it in general, um, un, un, unafraid to send someone down a certain road because I might be afraid I can't get them back from it. That doesn't bother me at all. So Michael, there, there's been lots of discussion about, you know, the great 20th century novel and, um, I don't know that anyone has ever settled that discussion, um, but I think we can all agree that F. Scott Fitzgerald, um, you know, really put a stamp on it with with the Great Gatsby, and and that's uh, that's one of those books that 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 everybody either has read or should read, and uh, you know, he did a lot for uh, for modern literature and in in that story. Um, what makes someone want to tackle? F. Scott Fitzgerald and say, you know what, I I see what you did there, Scott, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to finish the story for you. I'm going to give uh, the readers more context that you failed to give them, uh, and then do it in such a way that you go, you know, this is a, this is exactly what what needed to happen for this story. Well, first off, how did you ever get involved? You know, what what was the um, uh, what was the madness that made you want to tackle Fitzgerald? <laughs> That's a good way to put it. And looking back <laughs> on it now, I feel like it was madness. And I think even in the process of doing it, I knew it was madness, um, which is why I didn't tell any anyone I was doing it. Um, I had the notion, it was 2014, like this novel has such a crazy story behind it. It was 2014 and it was springtime. 
Rivers had come out in the fall of 13. So I had had a couple of books behind me then. I think I had kind of a rough draft of Desperation Road at that point. Like I was pretty far that kind of down the road with Desperation Road, but nothing like you, we see it now. Um, and I was looking for something to read one day. And I just grabbed uh, The Great Gatsby off my shelf because I couldn't really remember anything about it. And I hadn't read it in like 14 or 15 years and it was short. And I thought, okay, I'm, I can sit down. I'd knock this out, you know, in the afternoon. Um, so I picked it up and I sat down and I started <clears throat> reading it. And like I said, I hadn't read it in, at that stage. It was 15 or more years. And I had read it um, in college and thought, I don't understand what the big deal is about this novel and tossed it aside. And then I had read it when I was living abroad and the, the things kind of resonated with me a little more then. I began to see and feel some things in it then. But even so, set it aside until this third reading, which had come after um, me working my ass off to finally have some success as a writer, which took a long time after done things like get married and have children and cross a lot of bridges and lived a lot of life that I hadn't lived when I had read it earlier. Um, and it just really hit me and spoke to me in a way I was not expecting. Like I felt, I remember feeling a tremendous amount of loneliness in that novel, like Nick Carraway telling us the story in first person. I saw a lot between the lines. He felt very uh, lonely felt very desperate, felt very isolated. And those are emotions, you know, I've experienced, that we all have experienced, but I think, you know, I had certainly could relate to feeling those things. So when I read it this third time, I just really felt a great sense of loneliness and isolation in Nick Carraway, the way he was telling the story. And I kept going through it and, you know, not just that, but, you know, having had some success as a writer now, just the lyricism and the language of the novel, I mean, it was just every page, something just seemed to be speaking to me. And I got done. I didn't get done with it. I got toward the end where Nick realizes it's his birthday and he's forgotten. And not only that, it's his birthday, but it's his 30th birthday. You know, it's kind of a benchmark, you know, for yeah. it. And it just really struck me how detached someone has to be from themselves to not even realize it's their own birthday. And a few lines later, he refers to this coming decade as a decade of loneliness. And that just like that was the line that I think ultimately led me to writing Nick, because when I was 29 years old, I was coming back from Europe. I had I was trying to write. I was really lost. I had been gone from Mississippi for a long time. I came back to this small town where my friends had gotten jobs, gotten married, had kids and all this stuff. And I was kind of an alien. And I remember thinking, man, I'm about to turn 30. I have no idea what is about to happen to me. And that's the line that really struck me. And I, I finished the novel and I put it down. And I remember just kind of sitting there. And, and, and this is what I'm talking about, about getting an image or something stuck in your head so strongly and you feel like an emotion to it that you can't get rid of. So I sit down and start to kind of write it. I just kept thinking about Nick for the next few days, and how that had really resonated with me. And the thought, very simple thought crossed my mind. It would be really interesting if someone were to write his story because he tells us almost nothing about himself. Like what could possibly bring this guy to tell this story the way he does? And almost as soon as I had the thought before I could finish it, I just realized, well, why don't you do it? You know, you've been an expatriate. You know what that feels like. You know what it feels like to be away from home and to come back and to see things differently and feel very alien and not feel any really attachment to people or place anymore. And you know what it feels like, that great sense of loneliness. And you were really impacted by it. Hemingway and Fitzgerald and the Lost Generation writers, you know all about that. Why don't you just do it? And like two days later, I just sat down and started doing it. And you know, it's um, it was crazy. I didn't tell anybody. Kind of lap back around to how you frame the question about madness. Uh, <laughs> you know, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. I didn't tell my agent. I didn't tell my editor because I didn't want to hear that it was madness and I didn't want to hear that it was impossible and I didn't want to some anybody to ask me well are you crazy because I knew that would set me off the track so I sat down and 10 months later I came out of a room with Nick in my hand and passed it along and uh, that's when I think the comment was 
you did what? I said, yeah, <laughs> that's what I've been doing. And we just kind of went from there. How, how was it received when, when you kind of passed it up the chain and, you know, sent it to your agent, I'm, I'm assuming first and, um, you know, how, how was it received by, by the, the book publishing world and, you know, kind of, kind of what was the journey to get it out there? Well, the thing that, you know, you probably realize, which I also realize is every single person who reads this is going to come to it with their own preconceived notion of what it is. Right. Or what it's going to be like, you know. Um, and I think I've surprised a lot of people with what it is and what's it like. Um, but I think that was my agent's response. I think her response was, I cannot believe you did this the way you did it. Or that you pulled this off might have been her um, comment. Um and then we sent it to my editor, and I thought, you know, I'm sure the editor thought, well, this is kind of hokey. You know, of course, eyebrows raised, but, you know, what is this going to be? And then the, the exact comment was like, I'm just, they were just so happy and impressed about how I had, I guess I had delivered it, how I had done it. I was very, very happy with the way it turned out when I got done with it before I sent it to anybody. I told my wife, I said, I had somehow managed to write the exact novel that I wanted to write. Um, which I always, you always do that, but in writing Nick, it's a, it's a different animal. Like there's so many different balls to juggle in doing something like this. It's not like, it's different from writing Rivers or Desperation Road or The Fighter or Blackwood, you know? Um, there are many other things to consider for obvious reasons. And, uh, you know, I had to consider those through the process of doing it. But when I got finished, I was, I think I maybe even like stunned myself a little bit about just how happy I was at the way it turned out. Um, and then we went from there. The very next response was that the lawyers looked at it and they thought, you know what, this is great, but it's 2015 and the copyright doesn't expire on Gatsby till the end of 2020. If you publish this now, you're gonna get sued up one side and down the other. And that had not even occurred to me. Like during the writing of it, I guess because I kept it a secret and I was so kind of, protective of it. I did not even once think about a copyright issue or look it up, um, didn't care. Um, so then we had to sit there for four years and wait, four or five years and wait for it to be published, which is just another added dimension to the crazy journey of that novel. Isn't it a great feeling though, when you finish and you've written exactly the novel that you wanted to? Like that, that happens so rarely. I, I think there, there are lots of times when you write something that you're very pleased with and things that, that you think, well, I think this will be a commercial success, but to have something that just resonates with you personally, just so deeply that, you know, this is exactly what I want to do, you know, damn the torpedoes, you know, the, here, here we go. That that's, that is, that's an amazing feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think with Nick, it was even more important that I felt that way just because of the nature of, you know, what was going to happen with it. Like, I'm not naive. I knew that. I mean, I started getting hate mails about hate emails about Nick about five minutes after it was published. It was like people were just sitting around waiting. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. Like, I got more hate emails about Nick than I did when I wrote about the Confederate, about Mississippi should take the Confederate flag <laughs> off the state flag uh, which is very weird it tells you what a weird world uh, we live in um but i was I'm, i was and i am so proud of it like i think that really helped me kind of uh settle with what was coming kind of to use the word whirlwind again the whirlwind of what was going to be coming um, when nick published just because people have such strong feelings um about Gatsby, like apparently really strong feelings. But the other flip side of that is, you know, people like you, and I've also gotten a ton of messages and emails from people who absolutely love Gatsby and absolutely love Nick. And so it's just, it's a very, it's been all over the place, but I think my pride in what I did um, helped me settle into not really caring one way or another um, how people responded, you know? Which I think as an artist, you kind of have to. You do it for yourself first and everybody else second. And that doesn't just pertain to Nick, but to anything I write. Every, right. every novel I've written is for, for me first and for everybody else second. And you can't control everybody else. You can only control yourself. Yeah. And 
and, and what an amazing book it is. Uh, look, I, I have recommended it to so many people over the last couple months when when I kind of stumbled onto the book and uh, for whatever reason, I had kind of not heard about it. And I, I think I'm now that I think about it, I might have seen a cover or something. And um, but for whatever reason, I, I, I just didn't. I, I just stumbled on it and and uh, and I picked it up and I started reading and I was like, oh, my God, he he did it like this is this is the, the perfect companion to 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 Gatsby. And, and it really opens the story up in ways that that I never I never imagined. And uh, I was so glad that you did imagine it was, uh, you know, what an amazing accomplishment. Thank you. That's, that, thank you. That means a lot. And, you know, I think. I think one thing it's done too is brought people to Gatsby uh, who aren't necessarily familiar with it, um, which is fine. You know, one of the many balls to juggle in writing that novel was I also wanted it to feel like a standalone novel. I wanted it to feel like a lost generation novel too. You know, you could not even know who Jay Gatsby is. Yeah, you could not even know who Jay Gatsby is. And um, you could read Nick and I think enjoy the experience. Absolutely. So, Michael, I wanted to ask you what what you're up to uh, these days, uh, because uh, Nick has been out for for a couple of months now. And uh, and I know that you have turned your sights uh, to a new and different project. Tell, tell me about Rumble and and what has uh, has brought you to to uproot yourself and, and, and move south. Yeah, as we were talking before, me and my wife and kids have moved to Natchez, Mississippi for six weeks. Um, we're shooting Rumble Through the Dark, which is the screen adaptation of The Fighter. Um, and very excited. I wrote the screenplay, um, which I was really happy about the way it turned out. And have a great relationship with the directors and all the producers. And we are adding cast right now. And I'm thrilled with the way the casting is going. But, yeah, we're, I just decided to bring the family. and Let's just be here and see it all through. Um, it's just such a different experience making a movie and, and, and writing a novel um, for a million obvious reasons. But uh, yeah, I'm really interested to see Jack Boucher and all the Big Mama Sweet and Annette and all those characters come to life on screen. And I think we have some actors who are really going to just bring those roles home with authority, which is all you can really hope for. When do you think the public will get to see this story? It should be next year. We start shooting July 27th, and it wraps the end of August, um, post-production for a couple of months. Uh, but the film should be out next year sometime. I'm guessing late summer or uh, the fall. I guess, you know, it depends on a bunch of different things. But it, it should. It, I feel like it'll almost certainly be 2022. Nice. Uh, have you uh, secured distribution and, and all that stuff yet, or is that still to come in the process? Uh, that's still to come. We actually have some offers on the table already, which is kind of nice, but we're kind of waiting until we have the finished product and see what other offers come to the table as well. As well. <laughs> you don't want to sell yourself short too quickly, I'm finding out. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see how that turns out. I know it's going to be so much fun. Um, in the meantime, we're going to send everyone to pick up a copy of Nick. And, uh, and your other books, dig into all the great stuff that you do. We'll put links to it in the show notes of this episode. Um, but, Michael, if people are just learning about you and just discovering you and want to, you know, get in all into your world, where can they connect with you online? Uh, they should just go to my website, which is michaelferrissmith.com, and there's information and buy buttons for all the novels as well as reviews and all of my interviews and um all those things like that. We even have uh, some uh, some reading videos up too, you know, with, with the pandemic and all, we didn't get to do book events. And I actually had two novels come out during the pandemic, Blackwood in March of 20, and then Nick in 20, January 21. So uh, we also recorded some some very theatrical readings of those books too, which, but, which are also on the website. But yeah, pretty much everything MFS, you can find it on my website. Excellent. We'll link that up uh, as well to make it easy for folks to find you. Michael, a uh, huge fan of your work, and uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Well, thank you, Hank. I really appreciate it. Enjoy talking with you.
Wargate Books presents Hit and Fade, Forgotten Ruin, Book Two, by Jason Onspach and Nick Cole, narrated for you by Christopher Ryan Grant. Chapter One: The Army of the Dead walked straight into our ambush east of Fortress Hawthorne. That's what the fob is called now, Fortress Hawthorne. Despite it being officially known as Forward Operating Base Hawthorne, as was originally intended when the 50 detachments of various special operations groups came forward through time from Area 51, a one-way mission to save Western civilization from a rampaging nanoplague destroying the very fabric of said civilization. Apparently, we overshot the temporal insertion point and stuck the landing. Sorta. About 10,000 years too late. Said civilization is now basically something straight out of Tolkien, or Dungeons and Dragons. Which we've all now gotten a lot more familiar with thanks to our resident expert and fledgling hedge wizard, the infamous P.F.C. Kennedy. But the Rangers... Just call it the FOB. The first of our explosives to ruin the leading elements of the Army of the Dead advancing on us? Claymore Mines, the recaptured forge back at Hawthorne, had cranked out in the weeks after we'd retaken it from King Triton, were fired by Ranger Sergeant Kang down there with the scouts and Captain Knifehand's assaulters. It was close to midnight when the front rank of bony warriors, carrying rotting shields and spears, eyes glowing malevolently in the deep night mist, advanced into our ambush, only to get ruined by the daisy-chained Claymore's sudden eruption. Above us, a cloud-shrouded moon cast a wan yellow light over the battlefield. The night was hot, and spring was coming on full now. The pilots who'd gotten us here in the grounded C-17 back at Ranger Alamo, using their meteorology skills, had guessed it was going to be a long, hot summer ahead of us, and an early one at that. But there was a cold shiver in the dark on your exposed skin that you couldn't quite explain when you saw the dead advancing rank after rank. The bone warriors, carrying spear and shield, other, darker creatures barely seen. The lower areas of the earth were graveyard cool and misty, so maybe that was it. Still, the brutal, unrelenting cold of our almost last stand back at Ranger Alamo was gone now. But not the horrors. There wasn't a night that some ranger didn't wake up out of a tormented sleep, breathing heavy, sidearms scanning the dark and looking for orcs and ogres to ventilate. I was sweating in the hour leading up to the attack, despite the night and the mist. Kurtz had us humping hard to get the 240 and all its ammo up to the top of a small hill that overlooked the area where we'd channel the advancing echelons of the Army of the Dead into further fun and games the rangers had planned at a bend in a riverbed. If the approaching army of the dead continued on their current course track, they'd enter it for a brief period. It was decided by the captain, we'd kill them there. And I was sweating. Not because of fear. No, not at all. Firing whispered Sergeant Kang over the calm as he detonated the mines. And eight daisy-chained claymores spat thousands of steel balls all across the front line of what even I was still finding it hard to believe I was seeing through my night vision device. Skeletons. Warrior skeletons. Ancient warriors like something out of the Bronze or Iron Ages. Worked breastplates of molded plate or rotting scales, green and tarnished, stamped with the markings of fabled armies fallen in battles long, long ago. Leather cuirasses on some, rotting boots, helms with broken horns, missing teeth, tattered leather kilts, beads and charms dangling from bone wrists, enigmatic holy signs and primal torques black with grave dirt, or from a funeral pyre long ago on some forgotten battlefield far from here, 
draped about the spine where the throat should be, where it rises to connect to a bone-white skull that seems filled with malevolent purpose and diabolical intelligence, malignantly so. Walking skeletons like something out of a Ray Harryhausen clay model Sinbad epic from the 1960s. Above, the sliver of moon gave enough light to strengthen our NVGs, making the night vision devices perform exceptionally well as we sprang our trap and watched the advancing elements get rocked by our initial high-explosive opening bid in the game we were about to play. The air was still and hot in the moments before the fight began as we lay there in the tall, sharp grass, waiting for it all to go down. I was thinking a hot cup of coffee would be nice about now, except my canteen only had cold coffee I'd brewed during the long, silent, and windy afternoon of preparation. Still, I was happy knowing I had some, rather than none. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.